Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think People. Think People is made possible in part by support from the Community Foundation of the Gunnison Valley. To learn how you can make a difference, visit cfgv.org. The Community Foundation, we're here for good. Become a Think Radio Presents partner at patreon.com and you'll also get access to premium content you won't find anywhere else. Join us today. Today I present part one of my conversation with journalist and author Jonathan Thompson. A native of the San Juan Mountains in southwest Colorado, Thompson has spent his career writing about the land, culture, and communities of the American West. He served as editor-in-chief of High Country News from 2007 to 2010 and is still a contributing editor there. Thompson recently published a book called River of Lost Souls, The Science, Politics, and Greed Behind the Gold King Mine Disaster. The book has been described as part elegy, part ode, part investigative science journalism that chronicles the iconic spill. In 2015, it turned the Animus River in southwest Colorado orange and galvanized public awareness about legacy mines that are scattered throughout the West to this day. He has also just published his first novel, a crime thriller set in and around the Bears Ears region of Utah. Jonathan, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I was struck by the fact that your bio describes you as a sixth-generation San Juan mountain man. And, you know, if I do the math, that means that one of your ancestors had to be, like, one of the first people over the divide. There's got to be a story there. What is it? Yeah. um, So my ancestors came, family lore is a little confusing, but, yeah, definitely in 1874, the first people from my family came. I think it's my great, great, great grandmother. There may be another great great on there. I'm not sure. (laughs) They came over uh, from Kansas. Um why i don't know um you know i think that they were just like like other white settlers who came here they were just chasing the western dream yeah just kept coming um and they came from kansas and i don't know you know if somebody was here who told them to come or if they just went west and they stopped in the animus valley uh above durango um and they were yeah they were among the first kind of wave of settlers, I would say, although there was kind of a group, uh, this guy, Charles Baker, he led a group in of white people in from the Denver area. He, they had been part of the gold rush in Denver, the 1859 gold rush, and he mm. thought, you know, I wonder if there's something down there. And he <laughs> must have come through, you know, pretty close through Gunnison because he came in from the north and dropped down into Silverton. And he actually tried to kind of spawn a, a gold rush there in 1860 and 1861, and it didn't really work. Um, why, why not? Well, for one thing, um, you know, this was still strongly Ute territory mm-hmm. as well as Navajo kind of territory, and they they were not happy with him being there, and so they would raid his town, and, mm-hmm. you know, people had a hard time. Um, and then, you know, I, I just don't think that the gold was – people weren't finding what he promised. Mm-hmm. And it was super remote uh, life. And uh, and then the Civil War kind of started heating up. And so a lot of them went back to fight in the Civil mm-hmm. War. So it wasn't until about 1870 or so that uh, the next wave came in to that area. Yeah, and had more luck. <clears throat> right. Then they settled. So, so yeah, definitely my ancestors were among the first kind of white settlers to come in. They were kind of, yeah, in that first wave. Yeah. Well, and you've already used a word that I was coming to next, and that is this part of the country is extremely remote. It's extremely rugged. The San Juan Mountains sit at the southwest corner of Colorado. But, wow, it's hard to find a more rugged forbidding sort of opposing landscape. Yeah. Why did anyone ever settle there? How could you come from Kansas and get there and say, oh, this is it? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, the Durango area, which is where they settled. So they settled down in the valley there. It's actually pretty hospitable, I would say. And I mean, I think evidence of that is the fact that there was, before they came, there had been 10,000 years of human occupation 
-hmm. in that area. The Pueblo people were there, and before that, the Archaic people and Paleo people. So it, it it's not inhospitable there. Of course, if you go a little bit north, then you end up in Silverton, which I lived there for ten years, and it is inhospitable. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, you know that's crazy. That it's it's really crazy that people live there, and actually. In 1874, that same year, uh, the the USGS did a one of their surveys of the San Juan Mountains, the Hayden Survey, and uh, the they at that time Silverton was just getting started. It was just founded in 1874, and this guy who was with them, his name was Franklin Rhoda, and he wrote. He's he was very sort of poetic. He's a great writer, and he chronicled the whole adventure which was this crazy peak bagging adventure of the San Juans. Like they climbed all the biggest peaks. <laughs> and uh, and he was, he looked down at Silverton and said, this isn't going to last, you know. There, this, <laughs> there's no coal nearby. There is cold. It's, you know, it's not. Hard there may to get be, here. There may be minerals in those mountains, but, you know, that that's that doesn't matter because it's unlivable. Yeah. But he was, he was wrong. You know, he didn't quite, uh, I don't think, understand the, the, the links people would go to to get at that gold and, and silver and, you know, I mean, I guess you could call it greed or whatever you want to call it. But that drove people to do some pretty crazy things. Pretty crazy um, things. And towns like that's sprouted up all over Colorado and all over the West. Yeah. Um, many of which are now a pile of uh, lumber because they're ghost towns. But Silverton's not one of them. People still live there. People still live in Silverton, yeah. You yeah. owned a newspaper there. I did, yes. The uh, uh, what, What's it called? The Silverton Standard and the Miner. Yep, and it's actually, that remains uh, the oldest, the longest continuous running newspaper, I believe in the state. Oh, no, no, actually, maybe the Sawatch one's older, but <laughs> it's uh, definitely the longest um, running business on the west slope of Colorado. Wow. Uh, and it, they have published weekly every week since, I think, July 8, um, 1876 or 1874. Anyway, it was back then, and, and they have never missed an issue. Um, <laughs> Which is saying something, because you would think even a heavy snowfall could, could cause them to go home and, you know, sleep it off for a week and, and miss an issue. But no. So yeah. I can see in 1876, you know, the news was about gold. It was about mining. Mm -hmm. What about 1996? I mean, what does a paper like the Silverton Standard report on? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, in Silverton, as is probably the case in Gunnison and Crested Butte and, and other mountain towns, uh, politics are a big part of life. You know, even though this town's only got 400, 500 people in mm -hmm. year round. Mm -hmm. People love their politics or hate them or whatever, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and there are, there's always something going on. Um, plenty to argue about. There's plenty to argue about on a local level, but also, you know, this town's surrounded by public lands. So the, the San Juan County is one of the smaller counties in the state, um, definitely population-wise, but also even size-wise. But it's, I think, 86% public land. Um, mm -hmm. So you've got, and it's it's lands, a lot of it's wilderness area, a lot of it's BLM, a lot of it's forest service, so you've got all these different uses. And um, it's it's land that people really want to go to, to climb or to ski or to do whatever. So there's always something going on there as well. Um, so the local politics get tied up into kind of public lands politics all the time. Um, and not too long after I got there, uh, there was a proposal for to build a ski area, which was huge, and now that ski area is running, up and running, Silverton Mountain Ski Area. Mm -hmm. It's been up there for almost 20 years now, uh, 18 years, I think. So there's always something to write about. Um, you know, and also Silverton's a headwaters community. So it's right there at the near the headwaters of, of the Animas River and the Rio, Gr or, yeah, the Rio Grande is not that far away, the Gunnison River, um, the Uncompahgre River. So you do have... I think that there is sort of an interest from outside the community about what's going on there um, for various reasons. Yeah, we live in a, in a headwaters region here in the Gunnison Valley, and that's not a term that a lot of people are familiar with outside of the mountains. When you say a place is a headwaters community, what does that mean to you? Uh, I mean, one thing it means is that what happens there influences what happens downstream. All the way. S 
all the way, you know. <laughs> and I think that the, probably the best example of that uh, that was very visible was the Gold King Mine blowout uh, in 2015, where something that happened in Silverton and something that happened as a result of you know 100 over 100 years of history at this mine. Um, as well as more recent politics in Silverton regarding whether to be designated a Superfund site, that kind of thing, um, how that kind of resulted in this mind blowing out and contaminating the river, turning it orange um, for well over 100 miles downstream. Sure. And just creating, wreaking havoc uh, that still, you know, hasn't resolved itself. It's still unsettled and... Yeah, and so the color orange then became sort of emblematic of it's important what happens in Headwaters communities. Right. And so that brings us to the next phase of our conversation, really, because you've written a book about this, um, River of Lost Souls. Why did you pick that title? I want to start there because that is such a, a, a evocative and provocative title. What's behind that? Um, well, the, so the Animus River, the... The original name, actually, well, the original name given to it by a Spanish person who were the first European explorers to come through there. Uh, this guy, Riv Rivera, in 1765 came through and he looked at it and for some reason he decided it should be the Rio de los Animas, which is the Rio River of Souls mm -hmm. um, or possibly a river of soul. No one really knows exactly mm -hmm. why. And his diaries, unfortunately, his diaries are are ridiculously sparse. I mean, he doesn't really get all flowery or very descriptive. <laughs> so he just says he looked at the river and he called it that. Mm -hmm. um, over time, for some reason, people started calling it the River of Lost Souls. They, they, and they created a, a story that he had, that Rivera had actually lost his, some men or some horses or something in there. And that's why he called it Rio de los Animas Perdidas, River of Lost Souls. Uh -huh. That wasn't true. Um, you know, we have his, for a long time, nobody had read his diaries because they were lost. But um, later his diaries became available and we could see that he didn't name it that. But by that time, that name had stuck, River of Lost Souls. Um, and you see that like in the 1880s, the first mention in about the 1880s. And then it just, it just sticks. And so when I was growing up, that's what we called it. That's what my grandmother called it, you know, and she would say stuff like, don't, don't get too close to the river. If you fall in, you'll be one of those lost souls and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. So, uh, so it's, it's, you know, it, it, it fit, you know, because of that, but also because it just kind of fit the, the topic, um, and the, the subject matter. Well, yeah, that's why I, I pointed out is that it could hardly have been a better fit in some ways and, and, and has multiple layers, but let's mm -hmm. start with what actually happened there at the Gold King? Because look, it's 2019. How many um, dozens of news cycles have passed between that disaster and where we are today? It's, it's sort of fallen off the radar in some ways. As you say, it's still ongoing, but mm -hmm. nobody knows that, not really. Yeah. Um, so give us the sort of the elevator version of the history. What happened at the Gold King and why is it important that we still pay attention? Well, uh, I mean, I guess I'll start with that, what happened that day that, you know, it was an August day. There were EPA contractors up there working on this mine and I'll get to why in a minute, but they were working on this mine to figure out how to basically to clean it up. It was, it had become a big polluter. It was draining a lot of polluted water. Um, and they were messing around with it and they did not quite realize that uh, there had been a, a ceiling collapse in the mine, and that had created sort of a dam, mm. and that was holding this three million gallons of water back. And when they started digging around with their front end loader, which is probably wasn't a very smart thing to do, it it burst out, and three million gallons of water came flooding in down across the mine waste dump, which then took huge amounts of that with it, and went down uh, Cement Creek into Silverton and into the Animus River. And it was August, the Animus River was low and it was green, you know, it was this clear, and it immediately turned this horrible orange color. Um, and it took a long time for it to get to Durango. It took about 24 hours or more for it to get to Durango. But by that time, you know, everybody knew it was coming and, and there was this immense anticipation. Mm -hmm. And so people were standing on bridges and, 
and waiting, you know, for this thing to come. Like, and they didn't really know what it was at that point. It wasn't very clear what was going on. And and so, but it made this incredibly visual uh, kind of spectacle because yeah. from above, you've got the river. It's, it snakes along like this, you know, in these oxbows, and it moves really slowly. And so these news helicopters would go over and take these pictures of, you know, and it's this orange yellow menace kind of coming down just taking over the river very was, slowly very slowly yeah <laughs> and uh you know there was basically sort of a panic um because you know nobody really knew what it was and so they shut down all the water intakes they shut down the rafting industry they they would not allow people to go into the river everybody who was irrigating crops out of the river had to shut down their ditches um, and that was true all the way down basically to Lake Powell. And so uh, so in Durango, it was a big deal because the river runs right through town and the river has become sort of a an anchor for the town. This big green, it's a green space. It's ac- accessible. You mm-hmm. can go down mm-hmm. public access everywhere. People kayak. I mean, on any summer day. You can watch, and there's hundreds and hundreds of people on that river paddleboarding or rafting or what have you. On that day, there was nobody. You know, it was just mm-hmm. empty and desolate, strange scene. But so there was a, a you know, definitely an emotional connection in Durango. Uh, people were upset about that, but also economic because of the rafting industry. It was mm-hmm. shut down for two weeks. Did it turn out to be justified to shut it down? Was there a public health threat? Uh, probably or we just didn't like the fact not, that it was orange? Probably not like that, no. Yeah. I mean— now that it's all been said and done, and when they look mm-hmm. back at the water samples, they found that there were elevated levels of lead for a short period of time, mm-hmm. and that's concerning for human health. You know, you wouldn't want to drink that or spend a great deal of time in it. Mm-hmm. But if you were just rafting, you would would have been fine. You know, you could have waited in it. You would have been fine. Um, there was also mainly what it made it orange was iron, iron hydroxides, which is not that harmful. Mm-hmm. Um, so... No, there wasn't. In a way, it wasn't probably justified, um, or maybe the fear around it wasn't justified, in a in a pure scientific sense. Uh, but you know, there was kind of another level that uh, certainly down on the Navajo Nation. Um, there, they they again, you know, they weren't really sure what it was. Nobody knew at first what was going on mm-hmm. exactly, mm-hmm. Um, and so they just saw their river turn orange. Um, and it was, I think th- they had a deeper connection with the river even, you know, more of a spiritual sure, one. A sure. lot of them did. And so it was more alarming to them. And they did not want to put that water, no matter what the scientists said, they did not want to put that water on their fields. So a lot of fields went, you know, died or, mm-hmm. or and actually I went down um, to Shiprock a year ago about and and had a, a, a panel discussion with um, a bunch of uh, at one of the Shiprock at the Shiprock chapter house down there, and there were still Navajo farmers who would not put the water on their field. They will still not water their crops. Um, they, their their mm-hmm. fields are fallow because they they don't trust it, mm-hmm. and they want an assurance, you know, but. They don't necessarily trust the scientists or the EPA. You know, the EPA is coming and saying, hey, it's fine. You know, it's just like it was before. But that's a, another problem. Well, and that's a great problem to pick up and talk about because it really is one of the casualties of how we've managed um, mine mining waste in the western United States because this is not limited to the San Juan Mountains. There are situations like this brewing all over the place. And if you had to point to one thing that has been eroded the most, I think it might be trust. Mm -hmm. Is that your experience and and, and what you have seen happen here? Yeah. I mean, I I think, yes, for sure. I mean, I think trust, one of the things that the Gold King spill did is, so it was one big blowout that happened in one day, you know, in, Mm -hmm. in a very short term. That water... Had the ceiling not collapsed in that mine, um, that water would have just been flowing right out of the mine into the creek. Which it had every been doing day. Yeah. for a long time, right? Right. And it still does out of other mines. And it would have run straight into the creek. And so you would have had a gold, the equivalent of a Gold King spill every week or so rather than all in one blast. 
Um, and that had been going on for a long time. And, uh, you know, basically for 100 years b because these mines have been draining for that long. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that the, the Gold King blowout did was to bring that up and bring that into the public eye. And that, that's a good thing. But another thing it did was people said, wait, why didn't we know about this? Mm -hmm. If this was happening already, mm -hmm. no one told us, you know, we didn't know about it. And... It, because you described the water as that was coming out of the mine as polluted. Mm -hmm. What sorts of things are in it? Well, it's the the technical term for it is acid mine drainage, and it happens pretty much anywhere where you build where you dig a hole, a mine into a uh, a mountain with a lot of pyrite in it, which is just iron sulfide, and and essentially mining areas. Metal mining areas are almost always like that's one of the kind of prerequisites for sure. a metal mining area. So when you dig a hole in there, what happens is that the uh, first the first thing happens is that the hydrology, the groundwater hydrology, is hijacked by the mine because the water is going to, you know, to not humanize water, but it's going to seek the path of least resistance, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So you got this water it's trickling through, and it sees this really easy way to get out, and it goes kind of gets drawn to the mine. So then you got a bunch of water in there and you got your iron pyrite. And also when you built the mine, you introduced oxygen into it. And you, what you do is you end up getting a chemical reaction that leads to sulfuric acid, creation of sulfuric acid. And so that because the water becomes very acidic, um, you know, basically like lemon juice or, or something like that. Sometimes it's acidic as battery acid, depending on where you are. Um, and then it dissolves the metals that are naturally occurring. So you get metals like cadmium or lead or... You know, if, if you're in certain areas, mercury, uh, aluminum, zinc, you name it, that all gets dissolved. And so then you have this soup, uh, this water coming out that is basically, you know, it's it's toxic to fish for sure uh -huh. and to humans if they were to, to consume enough of it. And it's acidic. And so then uh, it just runs into the creek. Uh -huh. and Lodges in the sediment. Yep, lodges in the in sediment. The, in the ecosystem um, for as far down as, as the water flows. Yep, yep. You know, and it, and it gets diluted as it goes down. And so, you, but certainly in the Animus River, uh, you could see the effects um, of that in the fish. And the way you could see the effects was this weird thing is for a long time, the Clean Water Act required the, the operating miners to clean up their acid mine drainage. It's to treat it with a water treatment plant at the mouth of the mine. So it would come out, they treat it, they pour it in. The uh, the big mine that was up there, it went out of business in 1992. Uh, it kept treating the water, though, while it did cleanup. Eventually, it, it sold its water treatment plant to another guy. That guy went broke. The water treatment plant shut down. Mm. And between the time that the water treatment plant shut down and the next fish survey, the, the number of fish downstream, like as far as like 30 or 40 miles downstream, plummeted dramatically, as did the number of species of fish. At one point down above Durango, there had been like five species of fish, and there was, I don't know, a certain amount per mile that they had found. When they did the next count a few years after that water treatment plant shut down, um, they, found, they found only like two species of fish, and there were very few of them. Um, and that was um, that was probably forty miles downstream. So the science does not allow us to say, "Ah, eh, don't worry about it." This water comes out of the mountain like this all the time. No, the fact is these are extraordinary situations that require um, mitigation. That's yeah, that's correct. And the complicated thing is, is that there there are natural springs that are acidic. Um, there are, there is, when water runs across these rocks, like when you go over Red Mountain Pass, you see the orange and red rocks. Mm -hmm. When water runs over those, they're going to pick up some iron and it's going to go into the water. But mining, so so the water was never super, it was never perfectly pure. But uh, once you bring mining in, you you exacerbate that. And when you think of how many you know, probably hundreds of miles of tunnels there are in the San Juan Mountains around Silverton alone. You know, it's just this veritable acid mine drainage factory that's spewing stuff out every day after day mm -hmm. after day. And so, yeah, you, I think, um, you know, it, it, it's, there's differing kind of views of that, but I think that we all want clean water and we want fish and we want, 
that thing. And to, to have that, you need to to address this problem, which is extremely complicated. Well, and here's the other facet. It's the question, because as we've already mentioned, there are drainages all over the West mm-hmm. with, that could tell an identical story. Who's responsible for this? We've got these mines. Some, many of them are legacy going back. They've been shut down for decades. Yep. No one has owned them or operated them for a long time. Who is responsible for monitoring, surveying, um, checking up on on these um, acid factories, as you've called them? <laughs> well, the first <laughs> the first place that you know the responsible responsibility sort of goes to is the Colorado Department of of Mining and and Reclamation. Then uh, that kind of beyond that, it goes to the EPA. So it's us. It's the taxpayers, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, in either case. uh, The EPA, when they do Superfund or that kind of thing, then they try to go back and they try to find responsible parties. But like you say, in the case of the Gold King mine, um, it hasn't been mined for years and years, decades. And so it's hard to find that responsible party. Um, In that case, it's, it's a little bit... Um, different because there was a mining company. There actually is still a mining company in there, uh, the mi- the owners of the Sunnyside Mine, which shut, like I say, is shut down in 1992. Uh-huh. But they haven't been able to leave yet completely because they haven't quite cleaned up their mess or gotten to the point where uh-huh. they can kind of leave uh, and kind of brush wash their hands of it, so to speak. And well, so. Is it fair, in your opinion, to require modern-day mine operators to take responsibility for all of this legacy damage? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, sometimes yes. Um, well, certainly, I mean, I think if, if – in that case, so this they came along in the 80s and they bought this this mine. And then actually now even the, the parent company, which is some Canadian gigantic conglomerate, they bought it uh, right before it shut down, I think. Mm. Um in those cases, yeah, they bought it. They knew what they were getting into. Mm-hmm. You know, when they bought it, they knew that that there was this legacy there um, for this particular mine and that when they left, they were going to be responsible for stuff that happened before that. Um, in this case, they're also kind of being held responsible or may be held responsible for what happened in the Gold King mine, um, which is a nearby mine. And, you know, that gets extremely complicated because there were historic partnerships between the Gold King Mine and the Sunnyside Mine and and that sort of thing. So it's it's a hard, you know, it, it is hard because in their case, uh, even with just the Sunnyside Mine, they, they came in in the 80s. They bought it in, I think, 85, and it was closed in six years later. They ended up spending probably more money on cleanup than they ever made off that mine. Um, and the reason they did that is because, for one thing, they were required to by law. But the other reason is because they were owned by this giant corporation that mm. couldn't afford to be – to just leave. You know, they couldn't afford from a PR point of right. view just to leave. So they hmm. – you know, they're, they're, they're of course, own mines in Nevada and that sort of thing that are pulling in millions and millions of dollars a day. So they can afford it. But um, – yeah, whether it's fair or not, you know, it's it's definitely it, – it, there's some deep questions about what's going on and whether they should have to clean it up beyond the fat, beyond what it might have been naturally. Yeah. Um, and that sort of thing. Well, um, stuff for the lawyers to talk about. Actually. Exactly, yeah. And they are <laughs> talking about it still <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we move on from Gold King, because there's more to talk about with you and your writing and – your, your sort of career in the West. Um, I want to ask, what makes you say that that the Gold King um, situation is not yet resolved? Uh, well, um, for one thing, I mean, one thing that sometimes gets lost, the Gold King mine, so I, like I said, it was draining acid mine drainage. Mm-hmm. That didn't start happening until about 2000, and, about 2000, maybe a little bit afterwards. Before that, it was considered a dry mine. And so uh, what happened is that in 1996 and in 2000 and 2003, I believe, the Sunnyside mine that I was talking about, they plugged up their mine with these big 
concrete plugs. Uh -huh. That backed up water in there, and now the water is coming out of the Gold King. Uh -huh. Everybody knows, I mean, I think it's pretty well accepted that it's because of those three plugs that that water's coming out of there, that that's what happened. It backed up, came out. It wasn't supposed to. Hydraulic study, hydrologic studies that were done beforehand said that it would take at least 150 years for that water to back up and come back out somewhere. Mm. It, it took a matter of months, actually. Um, so it's a mystery. I mean, one thing is that it's a mystery. Nobody knows which one of those plugs is responsible for the water coming out. And that sounds like a weird technical uh, distinction, but the fact is, is that depending on which one it is, uh, that decides who's actually responsible. Um, it's possible that it's that when the Sunnyside mine dug their mine, that it actually drained water that was already coming out of the Gold King. It drained it down into there. So it's the Gold King's water, and they're just returning it uh, back to the Gold King, where it was originally coming from, <laughs> in which case the Sunnyside mine would theoretically not be responsible. Right. It's also possible it's coming out of the Sunnyside mine's property into the Gold King, which means it would be their responsibility. Uh, the problem is, is that all this is happening underground. Mm -hmm. There is no real way besides sending maybe robots down into the this conglomeration of tunnels and stuff that are all inundated in water yeah. and trying to go find where the connection is being made underground. And even that may not work. Um, so it's this big mystery that they're trying to – that's one of the things I think the EPA is probably trying to figure out. Um, to try to decide who's responsible and what can possibly be done about it. That is um, a really tangled knot that you just described. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> um, and it shows, it goes to show how persistent this problem of acid mine drainage is because, you know, the kind of intuitive solution is you just put a plug in the thing, right? And then the water won't come out anymore. And what's the problem? Well, at least not for 150 years. I mean, let's think about the people who will be living there 150 years from now. For right, a minute, but... right. And uh, but of course it turns out that even that was, yeah, you know, and yeah. so uh, you know there's really no way to solve the problem of acid mine drainage um, in in the sort of geology that's in the San Juan Mountains. The only way to deal with it is to treat the water forever in perpetuity, times um, thousands of mm -hmm. mines. Yeah, where, where this situation exists. Yeah. It's a lesson in un unintended consequences. Yeah, right? for sure. We needed the precious metals. Mm -hmm. We went and got it. Mm -hmm. Using the best technology available, the best knowledge available, maybe. <laughs> you know, the best sort of cultural attitude toward this kind of extraction at yeah. the time. And now here we are having to deal with it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, uh, there's probably... I mean, I think knowledge-wise, I think they knew, certainly the mining engineers knew that there was going to be a long-term impact, mm. that this wasn't going to be uh, no problem at all just because you couldn't mm. see the mines, you know, because they're underground. Um, I think they knew, you know, but they didn't care and they weren't forced to care because the, the government, there was no regulatory agency really for for a long time to make them do anything. And the mining law, the 1872 mining law, continues to be in place and doesn't really provide kind of remedies for this sort of thing. So, <laughs> you know, it still allows you to go and purpose. stake a claim on public land to yeah. mine it and to do it royalty free. There's no royalties on federal minerals, of hard rock minerals. So there's no way to, for example, create a fund that would help with these cleanups. So if they would have done that in the first place, if they would have done like they do with oil and gas maybe, where they're taking 12% uh -huh. of the take, if the federal government would have done that, then now we, there would be this huge fund, perhaps, if they would have saved it for cleanup. Uh -huh. But instead, the taxpayer is on the hook. So Yeah. Well, are we making progress toward dealing with that? Uh -huh. Changing the Mining Act, perhaps, or uh, amending it in some way? Sometimes to... it seems like it. I mean, I think the mm -hmm. Gold King spill it did, was a big catalyst for to renew the efforts to, to reform it. So far, it hasn't happened. I don't think it will probably will happen under our current Congress mm -hmm. or our current administration. Um, but it's certainly in the public eye, I think, that there is a feeling that there is a need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. And 
So eventually, yeah. Well, that's step one. Yeah. <laughs> Think Radio Presents is a production of Alan Morris Media. The show's producer is Isa Forrest. Associate producer, Aaron Lewis. Thanks for listening. Become a Think Radio Presents partner at patreon.com, and you'll also get access to premium content you won't find anywhere else. To leave a comment on today's show or to suggest a great story for a future episode, visit thinkradiopresents.com. Tune in next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think People. Thank you.